Yes, um, that's uh, okay. That's Perfect. So uh, yeah. good afternoon, evening, everyone. Um, so unfortunately, my colleague Rebecca Penzahick uh, couldn't be here today, but I will be sharing some of her slides. But we are going to, you know, over the next hour, provide some essential tips on skin care for common and emergency skin disease. Um, and just to run through, we're just going to start off by talking generally how best to maintain skin health. Um, look at some common treatments that we use in dermatology, and these will be topical treatments. Then look at the treatment of dry skin, treatment of scale, itch, blisters, wounds, and finally we'll end with scabies. So to start off with, how do we maintain skin health? Um, with our patients in dermatology, regardless of whether they're seen in the outpatient setting or as an inpatient, or we have a day centre where patients can attend for a number of hours, we really try to concentrate on the holistic care of a patient. So um, if a patient is seeing us for the treatment of severe psoriasis, but they are smoking, we will also try to provide some health promotion during that time as well. It's obviously very important to keep skin clean. Um, we find that um, some people often tend to actually overwash their skin so have multiple showers a day whereas we normally recommend just one bath or shower a day um, you need to keep the skin well hydrated both from oral intake but also by applying moisturizers promote environments where skin can heal and we'll talk about that a bit a little bit later and then prevent exposure to external factors that can harm skin so again um, that would be sun protection um, advising regarding smoking and etc and other factors that can have a negative impact on the skin. Um, I've already alluded to this um, we want to keep the skin clean but we want to make sure that patients are not overwashing. Quite commonly patients who will come to see me with vulval disease will often want to use lots of fragrance products and maybe wash every time after they've been to the bathroom as well and that can actually create a bit of a vicious cycle where you're um, perpetuating inflammation and, and skin disease as well. So as I said normally maximum 50 minutes once a day in tepid water. We do, rec we do recommend the use of non-soap products. We, for patients with severe skin condition, we would often recommend bland emollients to be applied to the skin and then washed off rather than any perfumed um, soaps or, or shower gels. Um, and then after washing, we would always recommend that you would pat dry and we wouldn't want patients to um, indulge in vigorous rubbing. Again, I think that, you know, some of our eczema patients will often look for ways that it's acceptable to um, scratch their skin. And, and you'll often see an eczema patient after having a shower sort of taking advantage if they've got a slightly rough tail towel to, to really sort of rub their skin. Um, so again, we would always want patients to pat their skin dry. Um, when we, as much as we can, um, and I have to say, we're challenged on a number of factors at the moment with, with um, our ward and outpatient settings and um, we do try to keep the care person centered so are you keeping the person at the center of any decision we're making so if a patient um if a, if a patient wants to um put moisturizers on and then have a shower we'll try and sort of work it into a routine that, that works for them and um, particularly if we're asking patients to put on complicated regimes at home I think it's really important that we make sure that the patients are happy with the regime that we're prescribing so that when they go home they have the confidence to apply their topicals. Um, we obviously uh, promote privacy and dignity um, and we've got some lots of um, um, materials and tools that work to, to help us do that. We promote self-care so where possible even if our patients are inpatients we ask them to do as much of their treatment as we can um, and basically trying to be proactive so that if we know somebody um, so in terms of what comes next in terms of if patients are applying topicals um, knowing what a patient should do when they need to wean down and when they should perhaps increase topicals or increase strength of steroids as well and then at all times maintaining communication with our patients. Um, 
furthermore this kind of is on a bit of a same theme um our holistic management will continue throughout our care of a patient um and so we have ways in our service that we monitor patients as i said common things that can be detrimental to health so we would manage that we would monitor if they smoke if they're drinking excessive amounts of alcohol um their weight and we would also look at their depression and anxiety as well we want to prevent further skin injury prevent infection um, ensure that a patient is having adequate nutrition and hydration um, ensure any pain is well controlled um, and actually that all other care providers are recognised that skin conditions can cause pain. Said promote psychological support and we have a number of ways that we can do that luckily in our centre but not many places can actually in the UK and then ensure that um, we're providing the optimum use, optimum skin environment um, for healing and whether that be through the use of topicals or dressings. So the main topical treatments that we use in dermatology are steroids and emollients, so steroids and moisturisers. And moisturisers or emollients are probably the most important part of a skincare regime. They have two key principles. They, they act to occlude the skin. And for example, if we use a greasy um, ointment that sort of sits on top of the skin, but it also increases skin hydration through a humectant effect. Generally speaking, we would ask patients to apply their emollient two to four times a day. Um, on Friday, we admitted a patient to our wards with uh, postulating psoriasis, and we would ask, be asking for her to have topical steroids put on twice a day and then emollients four to six hours. Um, I would say there's no right or wrong answer. My personal preference would be to apply emollients after bathing. Um, and then again, you would always want to apply gently to the skin. And again, in a sort of a stroke motion, I don't know if you can see that, rather than rubbing vigorously. If you rub rig vigorously, you increase the chances of folliculitis, um, which, which uh, you want to avoid. So why do we want to use emollients? We want to decrease the dryness and cracking of psoriasis plaques or any sort of dry, scaly skin. Using a regular moisturiser will improve symptoms of soreness and itching, and it will actually soften the scale as well. It's kind of like a primer, so it prepares the skin so that when you put treatments with active ingredients in, they're better absorbed. Um, evidence shows that regular use of moisturising can actually um, be, have a steroid sparing effect. So in patients with milder eczema, if they regularly use a moisturiser, you may be able to avoid using so much topical steroids. Um, and again, helps keep by keeping that skin in a better condition can be used as a maintenance um, between use of active treatments. Some moisturisers are more suited for um, um, for leave-on products and others, as I said, we would use as a soap substitute. Again, patient preferences is important. We're lucky to have a number of moisturisers available that we can prescribe. And there is, you know, it's it's important that patients find one that they like and they, they want to use. So quite often we prescribe patients a trial pack. So that's five mini moisturisers. They Patients will then take that home um, and then decide which one they like the most. And finally, we're more and more aware these days that emollients are a fire hazard. So not only firstly, when they're put straight onto the skin, but also if patients are wearing clothes that have had moisturized moisturizers um, or emollients saturated in them and they haven't been washed at the correct temperatures. Um, so we do advise patients to ensure that any clothing that comes into contact with emollients is washed regularly at a high temperature and that patients stay away from open fires and are careful with um, cigarettes etc. Further good practice tips, um, a lot of our emollients come in pump dispensers, so that means that there's minimal risk of infection or cross-contamination. If an emollient comes in a tub, we would always advise that it is um, decanted using a spoon or spatula. We would want to make sure that it's in stored appropriately, so that's in a cool, dry place um, with the lid firmly applied back on. Um, they can be placed in the fridge and that can actually be really useful in having a cooling sensation to the skin. So we'll talk about itch in a bit, but actually using um, emollient straight from the fridge um, can be quite a good tip for patients who are bothered with itchy skin.
if you're um, asking patients to apply topical treatments so active ingredients afterwards, I would wait at least 30 minutes. So you'd want the patient to put the emollient on, wait 30 minutes and then put their active treatments on. And the other thing with emollients is they can be applied to all skin. So whereas with steroids, you just want to apply them to active lesions, actually emollients can be put all over. And as I said before, you need to sort of stroke them in the direction of hair growth. Side effects, good thing about emollients is rarely do you see any side effects. Um, sometimes people can, can be irritated by certain constituents. And in that case, it might be worth, particularly if it's an eczema patient, considering whether they need to be patch tested to see if they're allergic to any of the ingredients. Some patients may feel they are messy. I've just mentioned the fire risk again. Um, I've mentioned folliculitis already. So that's if you're rubbing it in, it can, it can clog the hair follicles. Um, it can make floors and baths slippy as well. So if any patients are at risk of falls, we would want to make sure that um, we would want to make sure that they have bath mats or a suitable environment with which to apply their moisturizers. And, and finally, which I guess is more of an issue for you guys, that if, if emollients are being used in hotter climate, um, thicker emollients can make temperature regulations difficult um, for babies. Um, patients often use quite large amounts of emollients. Um, so if a patient has a widespread skin rash and you're asking them to put the emollient on, um, as we've said, sort of two to four times a day, they may need 600 grams a week, which would therefore equate to 2,400 grams a month as well. So that's often um, four or five big 500 gram tubes. That's what we find our moisturizers are prescribed in here. And generally speaking, children will need half the, these amounts as well. So moving on to steroids, um, in the UK, we grow, grade our steroids as mild, moderate, strong, and very strong. And there's all different um, versions of them. Um, actually, I was gonna say what I forgot to say about emollients, there are some emollients now that come with added ingredients. I'll mention them a bit later. And the same with topical steroids. Some topical steroids will just be topical steroids, but some will have um, added ingredients as well. So a topical steroid with added ingredients that we use quite a lot is Trimovate. That's a moderate potency um, steroid, and it has a steroid and antimicrobials in it, which is really useful for skin disease, particularly um, uh, psoriasis in, in the groin and flexures where you often get a little bit of contamination by microbials. Um, our steroids will come in a cream or an ointment and we also have um, impregnated tapes and, and plasters as well that we can get as well. Generally speaking in terms of um, you, we, you would pick different steroids depending on the thickness of the skin. So where on the body the skin is thinner, so say for instance, uh, the groin and the face, you'd want to use mild or moderate potency, but if you're applying steroids to the um, uh, soles of the feet and palms of the hands, you'd want to use very strong. And on trunk and limbs, you'd, you'd want to use a strong potency steroid. In order to ensure that patients are using the correct amount, we recommend that fingertip units are used. So if you squeeze out a ribbon of cream, um, um, you can then apply it to sort of two hands worth. It would equate to about two hands worth of skin. So um, but again, just to bear in mind that actually, if you have a patient who's erythrodermic, they could be using up to a quarter of a hundred gram tube in one application. So sort of 25, 25 grams. So side effects, generally, um, again, steroids are well tolerated, tolerated if they're used as prescribing. Prescribed, some patients do experience stinging and burning, particularly if you're using them on open areas. Um, but generally speaking, that they, they, they are well tolerated. If overused, they can cause skin thinning, so thinning of the skin, atrophy, skin and, and striae as well. It can worsen skin infection. So you wouldn't normally want to use um, standard uh, uh, topical steroids in viral infections. It can cause pigmentation changes and longer term uses um, can cause or overuse and longer term use of topical steroids can cause adrenal suppression. And we've also, there is um, some people um, in the UK Oh, and actually, uh, in, I know in America as well, I'm not sure how far globally it stretches to, but who now believe that topical steroids can cause a withdrawal issue if, if they're stopped after a while. And so there can be some kind of quite fixed beliefs around topical steroids. Again, I think that's 
for me that's um making sure that i talk to the patient making sure they understand why they're using the treatment how long how much and when they should stop as well and then listening to the patient if they do have any concerns as well and actually i find it's less of a problem um if you if, you know if you kind of set expectations well when you're first prescribing topical steroids um, we have dermatology videos that are available on YouTube um, and, and they're also on the British Association of Dermatologists website as well. Um, there are six videos, they're two minutes long and they're designed for patients. So um, they don't have a Burmese translation, I'm afraid. They do have accompanying patient information sheets as well, um, but they are, you know, if anyone thinks they would be useful they might be worth having a look at so they're just two to three minutes long they cover how to apply emollients and topical steroids safely um, how to treat psoriasis on the scalp and how to apply certain bandages such as wet wraps and occlusive dressings and paste bandages as well um, so we're going to talk now um, about dry skin so when is uh, when is skin dry so dry skin can affect um, people at all ages um, and it can be caused just to sort of as a gradual aging process but it can also be used to as to skin conditions such as eczema and ichthyosis or actually that patients have overused skincare products that dry the skin so you're what you're seeing is this decreased barrier function and increased transepidermal water loss um, in terms of managing um, dry skin, the two key principles are really to look at preventing any further drying effect and also to enhance moisturisation of the skin. So that's using lots of topical emollients. And again, often what's key is using a topical emollient that the patient likes because they'll be more likely to put it on. Um, also looking at what products are irritants. So say, for instance, if a patient has very dry skin on their hands, it might be worth thinking about what wet work they're doing, either in their job or around the house as well, and making sure where possible you're removing anything that could, could exacerbate um, the dryness. So for instance, soap products, avoiding perfumes, et cetera, as well. So I said washing with very bland emollients. So looking at scaling, um, scaling again is kind of almost like excessive dryness of, in a way. Um, so in terms of scaling in the skin, um, skin diseases that have uh, excessive scale or flaking are normally due to epidermal inflammation or proliferation, and they can be a clinical manifestation of stress and corneum disease um, or because of inadequate or flawed keratinization. And, and the picture here is a, is a very typical psoriasis plaque where you've got this um, you know, keratinization, which is happening much quicker than it should do, which leads to the production of these white silvery scales on the surface. Um, so examples of conditions whereby um, you can have scale are psoriasis, oh, sorry, psoriasis, ichthyosis, dermatitis or eczema, so seborrheic dermatitis, some tinea infections, um, crusted scabies, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, which is um, a rare lymphoma, which often in the early stages can be mistaken for eczema um, or psoriasis and dermatitis neglecta. And the picture there is a patient um, with uh, um, sort of marked scale because of psoriasis on the sole of their feet. Uh, a common scaly condition is scalp um, is, is scalp psoriasis or even some forms of eczema where you can get sort of thick scale build up on the scalp. Um, quite often with treating a scale on the scalp, the the really sort of key principle is using a number of products. Using one product by itself is rarely is rarely useful. First off, you need to soften the scale. Um, we would normally soften the scale using um, a keratolytic or emollient. So we perhaps might use a product which Sebco, or we might use coconut oil um, or um, just a hydromol, so a thick, greasy ointment. We would put the um, we would put the scale, we would put the product on the scalp and then leave it occluded, sometimes for a couple of hours, sometimes overnight, and then we would wash the then we would wash it out and with a medicated shampoo and then provide and then um, apply an active preparation. The active preparation would probably be steroid based. If it, I often find that some of the steroid um, scalp preparations have alcohol in them and that can be quite irritant to the scalp. So I often go for something that's a bit more gentler and less likely to skin. 
sting such as betnovate lotion or encelar foam as well and i think when i was out in 2020 we actually did a scout station with with some nurses and actually i think the one difference that we hadn't taken into account was obviously that a lot of um people in myanmar have very much longer hair than they do in the uk so definitely i would say that scalp challenging scalp treatment is much easier on people who have short hair because it is much more manageable in a in in terms of applying treatments and being able to lift the scale um, that's another tip as well we never pick um, we, we gently try to apply the treatment to the scalp and then lift the scale off with a plastic comb this is an example of our topical treatment plans as I said with the scalp treatment you might be asking people to put on two or three products a day um, and that can be you know, quite time consuming. And also when patients get home, they may forget which order to do it. So we developed these topical treatment plans so that if we're ever giving patients a variety of preparations, they can fill this in. Um, and then we fill this in, give it to the patient. Um, and then hopefully at the, in the confidence of their own home, they're able to apply the products. An easy way of doing that is actually just to do a, a day planner. So it might be, for instance, with the scalp treatment, I might say, you know, what time do you get home from work on 6 p.m.? OK, so apply the emollient then, um, you know, sort of wash it off just before bed at 11 o'clock and then put the steroid on straight after. So it just kind of helps make it very manageable for the patient. The same as um, for the patient, um, you know, the, the patient I just spoke about earlier, who's the pustular patient who went over to the ward, we sort of talked through that, you know, it would be good for her to put her, you know, for her to get up in the morning, have a shower um, and then apply the moisturizer, wait for an hour, put the steroid on and then wait a couple of hours, keep applying the steroid and then just before bed, sorry keep applying the emollient and then just before bed put the put the second application of steroid on as well just to kind of keep it break it down and make it more manageable um just gonna, okay and so for instance this would be a sort of typical psoriasis plaque that you may that we i may be asked to provide a treatment plan for so with a patient with a plaque like this you can see there's quite a lot of scale on it i definitely ask the patient to use a greasy emollient um examples that we have of greasy emollients are ones such as 50 50 or hydromol sometimes we'd use emollients with added products and so added urea because that kind of breaks down the scale a little bit more effectively and then i'd want to use a steroid with and an added ingredient of dip salicylic acid, which again would help remove, would help break down the scale. Um, isolated um, psoriasis plaques can sometimes be treated very effectively by putting a moisturizer on, waiting an hour, putting the steroid on, and then putting a plaster on top. It just provides a very sort of intense environment for skin healing. Emollient soaks are also very helpful for any patients who have excessive scale on their hands and feet. Um, you, well, you can actually do a, a bath as well. So you could use the same technique and, and put it in the bath as well. So again, with this, what we would do is we would decant some of the greasy emollient into a pot, um, sort of almost dissolve it in a little bit of water, add it to a bigger pot, and then ask the patient to soak their hands and feet for 10 to 15 minutes. Once they have done that, they would remove their hands. We would then apply steroids and then further occlude with gloves and socks as well. Again, um, I'd just say hydromol is very slippy. So if you are asking anybody to do that at home with their feet, just to make sure that if they are doing it, they don't need to get up or move um, shortly after or whilst doing this, because there can be a bit of a slip hazard. Um, so this is a patient who um, we I treated in our day unit and um, to be completely honest we didn't completely clear him with topicals and he um, transitioned onto a biologic treatment which actually um, uh, cleared his skin but we made very good progress with this and so with this patient we started off with emollient soaps we then used a very greasy moisturizer so our most greasy moisturizer which is 50 percent white soft paraffin 50 percent um, yellow soft yellow paraffin and then increased and then introduced um, an emollient with 25% urea when he could tolerate it. We then use some of our specials. So these are special combination of products that are approved by the British Association of Dermatologists and made up in our pharmacy. Um, there's one with propylene glycol in Dermavate cream, which really is great at absorbing into thick areas of skin. And one with um, Dermavate cream, propylene glycol, and also salicylic acid. So great at absorbing into into thick skin and also breaking down the scale. Um, we are aware that salicylic 
salicylate levels should be checked if patients are containing salicylic acid. Um, we don't have a hard and fast rule. It's just something that I would always check if I'm aware that somebody's been on um, a product containing salicylic acid for, say, um, you know, I would say normally six months or six months, six weeks or so, um, you would want to then check. Um, so now moving on to itchy skin. So it's well recognized that dry skin conditions can be itchy, eczema as well, but also I, you know, psoriasis as well. And it can be, if you ask patients, what's the one symptom that troubles them the most, um, it is normally itch. Um, itch then uh, interferes with all aspects of patient's life, particularly you know, interfering with sleep as well. Um, it's always worth remembering that other skin conditions may have an itchy phase. So for instance, bullous pemphigoid, you might get an itchy rash prior to seeing any, any, any active disease. And it can also be indicative of systemic disease. So for instance, kidney failure and also um, liver disease. And we recently had a patient who was attending our day center who had psoriasis, who always complained that it itched. He was started on TB chemoprophylaxis. Um, and, and came in and said, oh, you know, my skin's getting itchier and itchier um, and actually was having a, a liver insult basically from his um, TB chemoprophylaxis. So again, my learning point from this was if, you know, in having a patient who has an itchy skin disease, if they say their itch is changing or worsening, it is also sometimes worth looking for systemic causes as well. Um, there are also can finally conditions where histamine is released. So most common one for that is urticaria. So first rule is to really assess um, what the cause of itch with the cause of itch is, as this will obviously determine your treatment. Um, and if a systemic cause is suspected, then a blood workup will be needed. Sometimes you will get an itch of unknown cause, particularly in elder patients as well. And that can actually be, I find that quite tricky to manage, particularly if they've been referred into a dermatologist because um, they kind of want a more definite answer and there isn't one to be given. But obviously, if there is an underlying condition, that should be treated. Um, with urticaria, um, antihistamines will be needed and often antihistamines are given at very high doses, um, much higher than we would normally give for um, hay fever, but we don't prescribe antihistamines anymore for eczema patients unless we want it to have a sedating effect. Um, and again, I think historically in the UK, patients have been prescribed antihistamines, they have been helpful in sleep, um, and so it can be quite and, and, and patients might not realize that they're not helping the itch, but they are just sedating. So that can sometimes be a difficult conversation to have. But generally, you know, some of our consultants now will, will not refuse, will not prescribe um, antihistamines at all. Um, so with um, eczematous um, itch, definitely the sort of the, the, the key principles are making sure that you are avoiding any irritants at all. Um, applying topical steroids regularly um, and, and emollients as well and using when you're using topicals making sure that you use them for um, seven to ten days as well and then you can slowly reduce that down so actually that's another point I haven't said about topical steroids if we're asking patients to use them for a period of time we don't just stop it we would wean them down so every other day for a week um, and then for and then sort of at weekends and then slowly wean them off other helpful additional strategies are keeping skin cool, cool, which I guess might be easier in, in the UK than maybe in Myanmar, although we've recently had a bit of a hot spell here. Um, really encouraging patients to not scratch. And I think that's also something that patients may not realize how much they're scratching as well. And so sometimes I will say to people, oh, you know, try tapping instead of scratching. It's I know that's not an easy thing to do, but that you know, just to become more mindful. We do, there is habit reversal programs available as well. We run a um, Zoom group uh, whereby patients who are interested in learning a, a way of becoming more aware of their itch and then strategies to reduce it um, um, can join and, and there's a psychologist and a nurse and, and we run through it. Sometimes bandaging or wet wrapping can help as well. Um, and we would use those both on adults and on children. Um, wet wrapping in particular can be quite cooling on the skin. There are emollients with menthol in, included as an ingredient. That's often quite helpful, I find, more in our CTCL, so our cutaneous T-cell lymphoma patients, particularly at the, at the early stages as well. And occasionally UVB um, has been shown to be helpful as well. 
So moving on to blisters, um, two types of blisters. Obviously, you've got your larger blisters that you see with bullous pemphigoid, bullous drug eruptions and allergic reactions and then your smaller vesicles that you see with eczema hepaticum varicella zoster and pomflix eczema um, in terms of examples of blistering conditions for adults you have bullous pemphigoid pemphigus porphyria dermatitis hepatiformis and stephen johnson syndrome children bullous sympatigo eb bullous mastocytosis varicella and also school is staphylococcal stalled skin syndrome as well so in bullous pemphigoid, which um, we have a tertiary clinic for, um, the blisters are sub-epidermal and they will appear more tense. So, you know, that they're more obvious when you, when you see them on the patient and you're much more likely to see intact blisters on the skin. It can be very uncomfortable for patients, which, you know, is, is, is quite logical because you have these large tense blisters. And um, piercing can make the patient more comfortable but it can also increase the infection risk. So just to be aware of that. This is our preferred method of aspirating a blister. You'd obviously, before you started, you would want to make sure that you uh, consent the patient. Um, you would want to make sure that the, um, you would want to make sure that the uh, needle, the bevel of the needle, so the whole of the needle is facing upwards. You'd pierce the blister at the base, use a gauze pad to gently, uh, um, Apply, apply pressure and allow the fluid to, to drain out really by gravity. And then once you've completed uh, the bliss, uh, once the fluid has been removed, we just dab a little bit of an emollient with antimicrobials on top, just to kind of, again, a bit of trying to minimize infection. So this is how you don't aspirate a blister. So this is kind of doing everything wrong. So you have the bevel facing upwards, the, uh, the blisters um, being pierced at the the top and they're kind of really they're sort of aspirating the fluid with force which you don't want to do you want to let the fluid just just gently drain out I have no idea this picture has been banging around for years I've no idea for who actually where it actually came from or who consented for it to be taken um, this is pemphigus. And again, over the last two years, we've had a couple of real severe pemphigus patients admitted sometimes for months at a time um, with these patients you'll see more flaccid and fragile blisters and it'll be more unlikely for you to see them intact on patients it's very very painful for patients and so pain management is as important as skin care and for our pay for in any environment it's very time consuming and so we don't have a dedicated dermatology ward um, and but we have clinical nurse specialists who are often asked to to go to the wards and and dress and wash these patients and it can actually take several hours to do this Topical treatment. So how would you, what sort of topical treatments would you want to be applying? You would want to be using a so you'd want to be keeping it nice, quite bland and simple. You'd be using a soap substitute for washing. You would still want to try and wash these patients once a day. Potassium permanganate can be used as a way of sort of drying up areas, although there's lots of um, controversy in the UK about the use of potassium permanganate at the moment. We would want to use a um, regular emollient. Um, and steroids as well. So we'd want to be using a stronger steroid. You'd be going straight for a very potent dermavate in patients such as these. We tend to use non-adhesive dressings and we would want to, and we have these special sheets that you can kind of um, uh, butter, so sort of spread 50-50 on and the patient can lie on them and it's, it's non-adherent and hopefully makes the patient more comfortable. This is an example of our recent um, inpatient skincare plan for a patient um, with pemphigus. So we'd want to wash daily with octenison, which is an antimicrobial wash product, um, and then apply emollients. After an hour, we'd apply steroids and secure the patient with non-adhesive dressings and a secondary dressing. Um, and, and then and for, for certain areas, but then also just to um, nurse them on uh, the the extra dry as well so that's one piece non-adherent uh, wound dressing that's buttered with the 50 50. Um, if a patient is bed bound it can be very difficult to wash them um, and you can see this patient here obviously their, their buttocks are quite um, sort of broken down and, and, and almost macerated in areas. So we would want to also use a barrier cream protection. So for instance, ones that we use are a Medi Honey barrier cream or Cavalon. Um, we would try to wash them by saturating soft wipes or sterile gall swabs in the antimicrobial wash product, that's the Octenison, but we would just leave them on the skin for four minutes and we would wash them in sections as well. And this again would be 
for me would be really important that we try to maintain the patient's sort of privacy and dignity as well so you'd want to start off with the face ensure that the rest of the body is covered and then kind of wash and, and deal with each area um, first as well another little tip as well can be used is using a 50 ml syringe you can kind of dra drizzle water on patients as well which can be quite effective um, as well um, and as i said we don't generally use any um um, we would never rub, we don't use bath oils, and we don't use Dermal 500 actually for patients like this because it can be quite irritant, although again that does have antimicrobial properties. Um, we sometimes make balls, get large amounts of moisturisers and put them in a like bandage ball and so it can kind of be used as a bit of a soap as well because it sort of um, comes out through the holes in the, in the bandage. Um, Mouth care is very impatient, very important in, in patients such as this. Um, so we would want to use sort of just our general routine mouth care, but we'd also want to be making sure that the patient's keeping an or, adequate oral intake. Um, and if they're not making sure that we're supplementing it. So we would involve dietitians. And again, if patients have blisters in their mouth or active areas in their mouth, it can make eating and drinking very uncomfortable. So some of the an analgesia we use is a Diflam spray. Um, uh, we've got a special mix of uh, um, steroid, antifungal and antibiotic. Um, there's a product called Gel Clair, but you do need to wait 30 minutes before eating. And finally, we do have a mouthwash with, called Coke mouthwash, which, which is also useful. Um, this is the World Health Organization um, pain management scale. And again, we would make sure that that our patient's pain is well managed. Um, often with, with our pain, and we would use this as our principles, we would often go straight into step two for our Pemphigus patients. If the patient is using codeine, we obviously have to make sure that they're not taking paracetamol. And um, they often require morphine derivatives and something that we're using um, uh, that patients seem to find effective are fentanyl patches or lozenges as well. And we use the scale at the bottom to ask patients for the regarding. So it's their worst pain possible or no pain to give us an idea of how they're doing. And finally, a lot of these patients will often be on high dose systemic steroids for a period of time. And so what we do try to do is maintain um, monitor for side effects. So we would be looking for sleep deprivation, but also trying to keep an eye because we know that systemic steroids, when they're used in high doses, can be linked to psychiatric reactions as well. Um, and so if we do suspect, you know, often these patients are going through a difficult time anyway, in some of our severe Pemptigas patients that they may, you know, they may often often um, present with post-traumatic uh, stress disorder as well, so PTSD. So again, it's just important to kind of make sure that we're, you know, keeping an eye on our patient holistically. Um, last two sections, so chronic wound healing. Um, so chronic wound healing, so a chronic wound is generally considered as a wound that is over four weeks, um, four weeks long. Um, a wound becomes chronic because the phases of healing do not occur within a normal frame time. And so one or more of homeostasis, inflammation, proliferation or maturation are affected. How do we manage chronic wounds? We first need to understand the etiology of the wound and understand why it hasn't healed. So is there any underlying condition, for example, venous disease or diabetes, and then proactively managing those as well. And then we also need the skills for managing chronic wounds as well. Chronic wounds are problematic to treat. We have, obviously we have our dermatology day center. We also have a tissue viability um, team as well. And we have people in our communities who are very experienced in managing wounds. But I often find that patients patients kind of don't really don't sit with one team or another and there's often quite a lot of overlapping and, and we've got a, a patient at the moment um, with with quite severe wounds who we're sort of managing actually jointly with with TVN and dermatology. In terms of the principles for managing wounds, we refer to the time principles. So we want to be looking at tissue, infection, moisture and edge. And I'm just going to quickly re review these with you. So the tissue um, in the wound bed, wounds will not heal without healthy wound beds. We really need to make sure that wound beds are healthy. And if they're not healthy, we take steps to make them healthy. And um, slough, if there is the presence of slough or slough or necrotic tissue, they can be two examples of, of that there being problems within the wound bed. And in that case, you will need to proceed with debridement. Um, there are different ways of, of 
doing debridement. And again, this will depend on the wound. So for instance, there's autolytic. So that's using, optimizing your natural process through good dressings and that's slow, but it can be less painful for the patient. Um, you can apply enzymatic products to the wound and that can be effective, but also very expensive. We do still use larvae, but obviously we would use um, sort of biological larvae um, or, or maggots and that um, we need to get from a special place and that can be quite difficult to do so but that can help and you can also do mechanical debridement so that's physical and that's through dressings or gentle abrasion but that actually to be honest is not something that I would be familiar with um, and again we wouldn't routinely in our dermatology um, unit ever do uh, sort of sharp using surgical debridement um, that that would be something we would leave, need to more leave to more specialist teams. Um, infections, it's really important to monitor infections, but also recognize that most chronic wounds are colonized. So whenever, if we take swab results, we always review the swab results with the wound as well. We would never treat just on the basis of a swab result. And it's also worth recognizing that inflammation is a normal and helpful part of wound healing. And so it's really important that you identify when antibiotics are needed to ensure the appropriate use. And then also, if there are any concerns over which antibiotic to use, we would speak to microbiology. And we're very much, um, or, or, you know, that there is a lot of stewardship around the use of antibiotics. So we're really trying to reduce them to the occasions when we really need to. Um, and again, this table is quite helpful in actually showing sort of diagnostic criteria for lo local wound infection and, and also common signs of localised inflammation as, as well it's, uh, from one of our nursing journals. And obviously, this is a dressing that you wouldn't ever want to see in clinical practice um, the, the it's, it, you know, the, the, the correct dressings are not being used because the, the wound saturated to the outside. So you'd want to review the dressings that you that you wanted to use. Something commonly that's referred to us in dermatology um, is, is how to differentiate between cellulitis or varicose eczema. Um, they may both pre present as red legs. Generally speaking, I would say cellulitis would normally present with a quicker onset. The leg would be hot. You would normally have one leg involved, whereas with varicose eczema, you're going to have both legs involved as well. Um, and you, you, with cellulitis as well, it can also, as I said, quickly change. So it could be quickly extending. Um, varicose eczema, we'd obviously treat topically, but we'd also look at the reasons why the patient is, is, is presenting with varicose eczema. And is there anything from a lifestyle point of view that we can change? So, for instance, is that patient on their feet quite a lot and therefore might benefit from some light compression? Um, are they smoking? Um, yeah, just are they overweight as well? So as well as treating the actually what you see on the skin, we'd also want to look at the patient holistically as well. With cellulitis, we'd want to treat quickly with antibiotics. Um, moisture being present in a wound again it's often a balancing act um, you know wound exudate is a key component in wound healing and and you want to have a moist environment but if you have too much this can lead to further breakdown skin maceration and, and damage to the to the skin barrier overall wound exudate so anything being produced by the wound should be clear or pale yellow um, and it's also useful to protect the margins with a barrier product. So I, you know, the picture that I just showed of the pemphigus, their products as well that can be used as a sort of barrier um, to, to protect the barrier from breaking down. Um, this is so the edge again. So all wounds will rec will epithelialize from the edge. Um, and so in order for this, so it's a, it's important for this to recognize. So that's why it's really important that we protect that wound edge and make sure that we also have a healthy wound balance um, and that there's sufficient oxygen as well. You don't, what you don't want to see is any sort of overgranulation or malignancy in the wound edges. And my final topic is scabies. So scabies is caused by um, it's caused by a mite. It can affect any age group, but it's more common in the young and elderly. And what happens is a scabies mite it burrows into the skin of a, an infected individual and lays its eggs. It is transmitted by close physical contact um, and is sometimes also by shared bedding and towels as well. This is a picture of a patient with sort of normal scabies, you can get a hyper infestation of scabies. So Norwegian um, scabies, which may look slightly different, but this is a very good picture. And I have to say in, in my many years of dermatology, I've, you know, it's, it's rare that you, you don't often see such clear burrows. And um, the burrow will be a red dot with wavy lines. It can be seen anywhere, but the sort of 
good places to look are between fingers and toes, wrists and palms, ankles and soles of the feet, um, breasts and groin as well. Symptoms, it will be itchy. The patient will be complaining of, of really intense itch, especially at nighttime. You may see small dots on the skin and scratch, scratch marks, and you may sort of also see pustules as well if the skin is infected. Um, and generalised eczema can also be a problem as well. So patients may often be treated for eczema before you realise that they, they, they have scabies. This is the topical um, treatment regime. It's really important that the treat topical or the treatment is used at the same time that everything else is um, is treated in the house as well. And I'll show you that in a second. So if we are using permethrin cream, this is normally our first line treatment. You'd want to apply it topically to the entire body and then leave it in place for eight to 14 hours and repeat it again seven days later. If you have variation, there is a variation for Norwegian scabies, which is on the on, on the slide. Ivermectin is a tablet. You would normally take two doses one week apart, again, with a variation on the right for, for Norwegian scabies. But for sulfur ointment, that's actually something we've I've never used, but you would apparently apply topically to the entire body and wash off after 24 hours and you'd repeat for, for three doses. Sometimes, so for instance, I recently had a patient who was immunosuppressed. They were on um, azathioprine and a biologic and they developed scabies and we actually treated them both with ivermectin and permethrin cream as well. So top tips for scabies are to make sure that everybody's effect treated at the same time. I recently um, I had a patient actually this week who called me to say that his flatmate had been diagnosed with scabies. He had eczema. His itch had worsened. He'd had a virtual call with his GP, had been given some permethrin cream, had applied it but he was still very, very itchy. And that's also something else. So it's really important to recognize is that when you've applied this, that it may take a while for the itch to subside, even if you've actually effectively treated the, the, the scabies. However, when I spoke to this patient, I remembered the, the golden rule of always asking, what did he do with the cream? He'd actually only applied it to the areas where he had what he thought um, were the burrows. And um, so again, I kind of asked him to, to contact his GP again, get some more, Talk, talk to him through you'd need to treat your whole body and then repeat the treatment other little tip as well is is don't if you wash your hands make sure you apply the permethrin to your hands after washing because it needs to stay on your skin for that period of time um, and also avoid sexual contact as I said treat all bedding and clothing either by washing it at a high temperature or placing it in a plastic bag for for a week um, and, and putting it in a freezer as well. And if a patient has ever um, contracted scabies via sexual contact, we would recommend that they had a STD screen as well. Um, so I, the bit that I think I forgot, to, we, I can't remember if we mentioned it at the beginning, is that we have a British dermatological nursing group and we really want to support um, healthcare professionals in Myanmar. So if anybody's interested in becoming a member, we're happy to offer free membership. We have a lot of e-learning that you can access with a, with a password on our website. And we often have webinars um, as well. So if anybody is interested, please do contact this email address and we'll arrange for free membership for people. And it, you know, it might be suitable for any healthcare professionals. Um, we're not fussy. Um, and then, so that's me. I've got to an end and I'm happy to take any questions. Lucy, thank you so much. That was absolutely marvellous. And uh, there's been so many questions coming through. So I'm trying my best to uh, okay. answer some of them. But I've, I've got a okay. question that uh, I can sort of moderate to you if that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah that of was course, really, of course. Yeah, really fabulous, very practical. But of course, it is all about, you know, what is available locally and what's mm. available in the UK, but the, it's all about the principles, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yes, UK. yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Brilliant, so uh, let me just bring up some of the questions. Uh, let's start with the very quest first question, of course, um, you know, the, uh, it, it's relevant to medical patients, is about how frequently should they wash the hair of bedbound patients, yeah. um, such as, you know, those with stroke, yeah, um, I'm, I think it depends on the patient, actually. I mean, with some patients, you might get away with once a week. Um, others, you may need to do it more frequently. I, you know, again, um, it, and it depends on their hair type as well, I think, you know, and what facilities you have available. But I mean, I would aim for as a guide at least once a week, I would say, if somebody is bed bound, if that's 
if that's practical yeah no that's great thank you I think it you know uh, you you did a fabulous job trying to break it down between you know lotions creams uh ointments and so on but it would you mind to just to summarize because I think there's been quite a few questions around you know some people don't like Vaseline um, and what's the key difference between sort of you know something like Cetaphil moisturizer and Vaseline yeah if you don't mind yeah yeah so obviously so ointments are very greasy um but they're often the best at kind of you know providing um you know providing that 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 sort of protective layer to the skin repairing the skin barrier um whereas cetaphil is a, is a lotion so it's very light but patients may want to use it because it absorbs into the skin more naturally so that's why i think it is you know as a rule um the more scale or the more drier the skin is the more you will want to use a greasy ointment um if a patient is very hairy um then you may want to go for a more lotion based um, emollient and then creams kind of sit in the middle they're they're sort of they are very cosmetically except they're often a bit more cosmetically acceptable they're often easier to use in hotter temperatures as well um, but I think the key is is often finding out what your patient wants to use and a lot of our patients will not use anything that's very greasy because they will have to wait at least an hour to put their clothes on it might actually soak into their clothes and be visible as well um, in, and sometimes people will may use a greasy um, ointment, say at the weekend when they're at home, but during the week they'll use a cream because that's more absorbed into the skin more easily. Absolutely. No, I think you're right. You know, to, to, if uh, the patient doesn't like something that you prescribe and the, the topical is going to sit in the pot, then that's actually yeah, exactly. so it's not yes, 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 yes. something that they're going to use. So that's, yes. that's great. And and. Any comments about, you know, things like trimovate, so combination therapy, so, um, you know, under what circumstances would you yeah. recommend, of course, if there's no clinical indication, you won't use yeah. it, but what sort of conditions? So, yeah, I mean, I, I do like trimovate um, because I think if you if there's a hint of an infection and you need a steroid, then I think trimovate is always a good bet. Um, um, so, yeah, so if you suspect there's any sort of bacterial or light light fungal infection in an area it's very useful so you know psoriasis quite under the breast you'll often see that the red the skin will be sort of very red and shiny but it will be very very damp and I think that if you use trimovate that kind of dries it up but also um, helps prevent there being any any other infections there as well as well Mm, no absolutely and um, another question, which is quite interesting, is about the basic sort of uh, skin health, really. So yeah. without using emollients and various soaps and things, can the skin uh, stay healthy lifelong? <laughs> but I guess... I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, I guess it depends on what yeah. else that person's doing. Doesn't it? I mean, it's yeah, like, um, I, I think, it, yeah, I mean, I, I've got a, a, a family relative who is a reclusive nun and, you know, so she mostly spent her time inside. She lived in Italy. Her skin was amazing and she did very little with it. But again, I think, yeah. you know, I think there's the sun can be very damaging. External factors can be very damaging. I think you need a basic level of, of skin care. Yeah, absolutely. Because, um, of course, you know, as one um, gets older gracefully, uh, the skin barrier <laughs> becomes yes. uh, a bit more effect- a bit less effective. Yeah. You know, yeah. skin becomes thinner and it becomes more porous so yeah. I think yeah. that moisture is really key isn't it yeah so, yeah but of course I, think, I don't know whether you tried the Nakar in Myanmar when you were out there no you know, the, no we didn't yeah. so yes no we saw else, it yeah. we saw lots yes. of it but yes we didn't we didn't try it no that's a, no, yeah. no but but of course you know most people just use that and you know it, it's cooling yeah. and it has yes. a different yeah. sort of a sunscreen um properties as well so that, that's yeah. uh, that's also interesting now a bit more about uh just sticking to the theme of dry skin so there's one question yeah. about you know treatment of uh, ichthyosis but of yeah. course that's sort of an extreme example rare disease but any tips on that one please um yeah so again i think it's using the right emollient um 
and we um we've recently had a webinar on this and so some of our patients were saying it's it's the the feedback we got was that it's using an emollient with added ingredients and that but then being careful because they may be patients who and sue you'll probably know more than me but you know may want to use added emollients with lots of urea in them to help manage their skin rather than just plain emollients and then some of our some of the patients talking about lactic acid products as well to help further break down the skin Um, absolutely absolutely I don't know whether the urea based products are available in Myanmar actually but that's something that we really love in rare Mm. disease clinics of course as you know the other thing is that, you know, again, the availability of acetretin orally yeah. is, yeah. is um, variable throughout Myanmar, but that's another sort of go-to systemic agent for yeah. ichthyosis yeah. patients uh, as well yes. Yes. in the UK. Yes. So now, so that's all about dry skin. And now moving on to a bit more about, you know, itchy skin. Yeah. So any recommendation on that one? Do you like calamine lotion at all? Yeah, so calamine lotion, I think, um, is quite drying to the skin. So mm-hmm. I actually try to avoid it now. Um, so other so the tips, putting the moisturiser in the fridge is definitely very helpful. Um, we have spray moisturisers, which again, patients report have a cooling sensation. The moisturisers with added menthol in them can be useful. Um, An oat bath, so tepid oat baths um, can also be very helpful for itch as well. And then again, looking at other, so clothing. So in terms of making sure, you know, patients wearing natural fabrics, um, natural bedding as well. And something we've been sort of saying this week when it's been slightly hot in the UK is, you know, having a, a, a tepid shower or a cooler shower having your shower of the day just before you go to bed so that your skin is cooled down you can then put some light cotton clothing on and sleep with a cotton sheet might help as well no absolutely I think most um, people in Yamaha have cold showers anyway because I, I do the right okay yeah 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 actually in, in Yangon you're right you know some of course hotels and some sort of more affluent areas there's a the availability of warm warm um, yeah. showers so absolutely just sticking to the traditional ways are probably yeah. the yes. best yeah um now I've, i'm going to clump together the rest of the questions because there are three main things really one is about antifungals another one's about antibacterials and then the scabies treatment and yeah. then there's one yeah. minor question about use all in wound debridement so starting with the antifungal so keto yeah. or shampoo how yes. often would yes. you recommend using them so you could use that daily um that would be fine you could use a yeah ketoconazole shampoo daily and then you see how it goes um something like that wouldn't ne- you wouldn't necessarily you wouldn't necessarily have to reduce it down either because it's not a steroid so yeah you could use it daily and then I'd probably Absolutely. introduce another gentler um, medicated shampoo after that. Mm. And there's no sort of limit to how long you can use it for, is there? No, Depending on the no, no, improvement. no, exactly. Yeah. I sometimes like to sort of mix things about. So, you know, if, if there are products, so say with the Dermal 500, if you're using that as a soap substitute, for, then you wouldn't use that longer term. You sort of reserve that for when your skin's a little bit more active and then move on to something else. No, absolutely. So uh, that's the antifungal bit. And then in terms of antibacterials, I mean, do you have a particular recommend? I mean, we love the fusidin. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah UK, exactly. Yeah. So neomycin, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 But again, you know, we've got a couple of patients now who, when we swab them, they this the staph aureus has shown fusidin resistance. So we've had mm. to switch them to vetinovate C. So you know, it's something that we try to use only when we need to use and I definitely wouldn't yeah. want people using Fusivet um long term I think yeah. GPs here still quite like our GPs like to give out Fusidin H if there's any doubt you know and, and it does work well but it does make you worry you think gosh 15 20 years time how useful would it be yeah. I don't know no exactly but I guess you know it depends on the local resistant strains but yes I mean just to highlight that there is a, a global issue now with resistant strains of yeah. tinea yeah. i mean you know in um in Myanmar, i you know based on um 
some of the dermatology colleagues that we've been talking to, there's triple the number of uh, resistant tinea uh, wow. issues, as well as yeah. deep fun fungal infections like mycetoma, yeah. Yeah. chromoblastomycosis, that's actually you know, risen in number dramatically yeah. um, over the past year. So there's definitely um, an area of research that we are actually working on through the BSI yeah. to try and understand a bit more about these species and what they can respond to. Yeah. Um, now, uh, so two, well, I, there's one about permethrin, really. Uh, if uh, somebody swallows permethrin, how do we how do we treat it? So that's more of sort of medical emergency rather yeah, than so yeah. we dermatologists wouldn't be the first people <laughs> to be dealing with this. But, you know, of course, it's if whether chart, you know, I, I cannot actually um, provide advice on this, but whether Sia Sunny might be able to make any comments at all. But this is certainly a case of emergency, depending on how much they've swallowed it, mm. whether they've actually, you know, ingested it or they just, you know, in the mouth. But as soon, it, as much as possible to um, induce vomit so that they then get things out. But other than that, I'll just send them to uh, emergency department. Mm. See, Sunny, what do you think? I think that would be the best advice to go to emergency, make them vomit actually. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, you saw in wound abritement and dressing in the UK, is that commonly used? Uh, no, I'm just trying to find... Um, no, I'll have a quick look at it now on the internet. That's not something I'm familiar yeah. with. Not at all, no. Um, and no, it's, an, it's a yeah. solution of lime and boric acid. So, no, that yes. wouldn't be something that I'm familiar yeah. with in the UK. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, I haven't come across it either. And then, la what's, right, so two last questions, really. One is about povidone iodine in different concentrations on wound healing. Is the higher the concentration, the more toxic? Or how do you adjust the concentration of iodine? Yeah, so we rarely use iodine yeah. in wound healing. We'd use it pre-surgery. I think in the UK they would still use that, but we it rarely has a role to play, I'm afraid, in wound management. Yeah. So the final one is about the secondary bacterial infec infection in scabies. What's your approach um, on that one, please, please? Yes, I mean, so generally, if you, you know, going back to the slide, um, we would treat it, um, we would treat we would want to start off treating um, the, the make sure that you treat the scabies effectively as, as well. And then, I mean, it would depend on the presentation, but normally they kind of, uh, we've had flu clots prescribed before. So have you done, was is that what you would normally do? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think, yeah. Um, no, I agree with you. I think depending on, you know, how it, yeah. um, severe the skin infection is, you know, you yeah. may, it may just be, if it's localised, then you might just end up using topical antibacterial yeah. like fusidin. Yeah. And if it's more widespread than uh, oral flucloxacillin. Yeah. Actually, you're go -to. right. You would, yeah, you would normally try to treat it topically yeah. first rather if, than, if yeah, possible. go straight. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. No, that's fantastic, uh, Lucy. And um, by the way, I just want to, so this is something that I should have sent a while ago. There is a survey feedback. Um, if you could, please, please fill it out because last time there were 300 attendees and half of you kindly filled it out and that was really very helpful. So we really take that seriously. And, um, and also it will be your chance to tell us what sort of topics you'd like to to learn in the future. So let me just uh, get the um, get the link and send it to you. Or oh. see, Sunny, do you have one? Uh, uh, so I, I did have it. I've got it here. I've got it here. There we are. Brilliant. There we are. So I've um, put it in the chat. So if you could kindly complete that, that would be brilliant and also there are two further um, webinar series next one is about common and emergency skin disease in children and CR Sunny will circulate the dates and I believe it's the second week of September I think CR is that right the, yes. the 10th of, the 10th yeah 
Yeah, the 10th of September. Yeah, the 10th of September. And then the last one is about infectious diseases, uh, HIV, dermatoses, and also sexually transmitted infections. So really great lectures lined up. So the last one is on the 24th of September. Well, thank you so much, Sia Sunny. I wonder oh, whether there's any other- uh, Thank benefit. you very much, Lucy. Very useful, practical information uh, on you know day-to-day -day management of skin problems. Wish I'd known that when I started as a GP, actually, this sort of information is so useful. And Sue, really impressed with the way you went through those questions. Oh, yeah. God, yes. That was so- <laughs> I've just looked back, that's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Really well done. Thank <laughs> Namla Maro, August Maro, webinar on the QR, QR general diabetes diagnosis and management of the Pyome. We are now second webinar, August Lago Gani Maro, general quality improvement, but not GPD, second quality improvement, but lowly young as well. You then the introduction in the general Pyome. Okay. Hello, Teo Library, Sir Timari. Sir Hinko Goba, Rosia. Okay, was your Sabi for general. GV education Facebook page can be recording video net to general team be by my Okay, and uh, and also thank you so much, Lucy, for giving up your time during the weekend. And uh, no. very very yeah. grateful to you. No, thank you for asking me. I said the British Dermatological Nursing Group really want to support as much as we can our fellow healthcare professionals in Myanmar. So. Absolutely. Oh, Just to see our, as, as the last word, if you don't mind, because there were a couple of people um, who sent the message to me directly about uh, requiring specific advice on the skin conditions that they're seeing. So during the last webinar, um, we sent out a survey about teledermatology service. So Lucy has very kindly signed up to it as well. So there Essentially, this is once in a lifetime opportunity and really I'm so um, overwhelmed by the response that we, we have received. So based on the survey last time, a lot of you think that teledermatology service providing in Myanmar would be really very helpful for you. And essentially what it means is that if you have difficult cases for diagnosis or management, um, you will be able to share those cases with us directly, us being a group of expert dermatologists, you know, world's expert dermatologists and nurse consultants like Lucy herself would receive your queries and able to provide advice via a mobile phone app. And we have, um, we are going through the, uh, the testing phase at the moment. So when it's launched, we will liaise closely with Sia Sunny and uh, let you all know. So mm. that's 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 for the future. That would really be useful for our GPs to get a, a, expert advice from international experts. Actually. Absolutely, e even even uh, um, different regions in the UK don't have such specialist yeah. Yeah. <laughs> expert advice. Yeah. You know, if you live in Scotland, you won't have that luxury. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're making this happen for Myanmar anyway. Okay. So, no, uh, thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you. Great to the questions. Sarah, hello, Jesus, tomorrow, hello.